Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Political Courage Podcast, the podcast dedicated to telling the stories of courageous people in politics. Please visit our website at douglas-perkins.com forward slash polit political courage. You'll find links there for our social media accounts and also a button to donate to help us continue providing these interviews and episodes. So today we are going to continue our discussion on Afghanistan and foreign policy. And today's interview, it proves to be very fascinating. Um, we're going to talk to Tony Schaefer about the Middle East, foreign policy, and pol uh, political leadership. So with that, I'd like to welcome Tony Schaefer. Tony is a retired lieutenant colonel and a CIA-trained intelligence operative. He has 35 years' experience in global and national security, and he is a New York Times bestselling author of Operation Dark Heart. He is the president of London Center for Policy Research in New York City. The London Center is a conservative policy think tank. And in his think tank work at the London Center, Tony works as an advisor to senior members of the White House staff, the intelligence community, community Pentagon, and members of Congress. So with that, welcome, Tony. Uh, thanks for having me. Good to be on. So with that, um, sure. I was re researching a little bit about you and about the London Center. And on your website, I want to read the byline um, that the London Center for Policy Research has online. It says, okay. quote, quote, challenging conventional wisdom, adding texture to the current deliberations on policy, and building support for positions that further the national interest, unquote. Then there's also a quote on there that I found very interesting from Herbert London, the, the center's founder. It says, quote, he, he, he said, quote, it is my goal to make the London Center the premier foreign policy institute in the country, one that is shaping the debate on international affairs and influencing decisions emerging from Congress. So with that brief introduction for the center, Tony, will you tell us about the center briefly and its goals uh, in policy research and, and I'm assuming in lobbying to, as well, correct? Well, we don't lobby since we're a public charity and an okay. educational institute. Um, we could, but you'd have to go into all sorts of different financial disclosures, so that's something we just don't do. So instead of that, we offer our advice to any member of Congress, any official, frankly, any organization that uh, has an interest of actually uh, working towards an understanding of some of the more complex issues regarding foreign policy. Now, in my judgment, and Dr. London, her, our founder, is that... Uh, Foreign policy, policy touches everything. So, uh, you know, we're talking about energy. I actually have a degree in environmental studies, which I'd like to believe that's one of the reasons for it brought me in. Uh, I've also got a, a degree in political science and that uh, people misunderstand uh, all the time what political science is. Political science is not political science. It's essentially a, an amalgamation of sociology, psychology, uh, history, uh, and uh, a number of other things which come together for purposes of political discourse. Uh, a good political scientist is actually a, a scholar of all those issues. And I think this is one of those things that people tend to forget, is that political science is about mankind. It's about how we interact, how we evolve, and how we affect governance uh, throughout the world. So. Um, my expertise is based on my experience being an op a, a intelligence operator. And for your audience to understand, there is a, a difference with a distinction regarding intelligence officers. Uh, there's not like a generic intelligence officer. There's uh, a number of, of focus areas which people really do specialize in. Uh, you have analysts who theoretically are able to take and digest huge, huge amounts of information from multiple sources. You have a variety of, of individuals who collect information. I'm a collector. Uh, 
the collectors then are broken up into different categories. My specialty has always been operational support to special operations. And so that's why if you read my, my book, Operation Darkheart, it, the first chapter is me on an air assault with the Rangers. So it's not like we sit back and just hope for things to come to us. A, a good collector, a good operator is going to be out doing things with operators, trying to, to get things done. So this is, this is what I did for most of my careers from, from being a very uh, young and active lieutenant uh, chasing terrorists in Germany uh, all the way up to, you know, running global operations through, uh, through bases I commanded, uh, as well as going forward to support uh, our combat operations. So th that's the, the background that I bring. And then the think tank's mission, uh, I believe, uh, is something now that I'm happy to try to, to uh, facilitate what Herb's vision was, to make us the premier organization regarding people coming to us and asking for advice, asking us to answer hard questions. We've run a number of teams. One of them, uh, it's a little bit out there, Team B. Team B was an organization of experts, practitioners, that uh, focused on uh, uh, helping advise uh, folks in the Obama administration, folks in the Trump administration, that was uh, focused on how we establish uh, policies and capacities to defeat uh, a number of adversaries. And uh, that's what we focused on. That's what we did. And, and we continue to do as best we can, despite the fact that a lot of folks don't seem to like our advice because <laughs> we tend to be very direct and provide uh, assessments which are often very correct. Unfortunately, they go against the political narrative or the, uh, the advocacy of a political group uh, because so much of what happens in Washington now and New York has to do with supporting a position of a political party, uh, their their aspirations rather than uh, being direct and blunt in your assessment of, of the, the failure, the potential failure, or the shortcomings of, of what they want to do. Okay, Th that's fascinating because my next question was going to be, you know, what what Herbert London, what Dr. London said, yeah. he mentioned international affairs. Yes. And so my next question was going to be on your website. You list domestic policy, energy, foreign, human rights, international conflicts, mission, uh, missile defense, national defense. But so political science and international affairs, what you're saying then is all of those are encompassed into international affairs and into political science. Well, I believe they are. If you just, yeah, if you examine kind of the, the, the tapestry of, of our government's activities, of business, of energy, everything overlaps. And I, I don't, you know, people tend to try to, I think, uh, specialize. And, and that's good. I, people should specialize. Uh, look, we have several experts who are specialists. Uh, Gordon Chang, uh, yes. a well-known well uh, China expert. Uh, he's uh, amazing. Dr. Steve Hatfield, uh, a virologist. Uh, as you might remember, he was the... Uh, the guy that uh, Robert Mueller accused of being the anthrax, uh, and, and of course, Steve sued him and got millions of dollars out of that because he, he's, he's on our side, he's a good guy. Uh, and then we have others who are much much more general. Uh, one of my friends and mentors is Bud McFarland, the National Security Advisor and President Reagan. I spent some time with him recently and uh, trying to absorb some of the, the knowledge that they uh, had come up with during their time in office. So we, we do have a lot of folks who are uh, very much uh, experts in their area. And my job as the president is trying to make sure that they're successful in going out and establishing uh, a greater understanding for purposes of forwarding our national interest. Okay, good. So would you say you were talking about the, the parties um, within Congress, you know, both sides of the aisle, you're talking mm -hmm. about uh, any given administration. You mentioned Trump and you mentioned Obama. Yeah. Um, would you say you're a conservative based think tank? An or a, 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 your center is has that sort of a basis to it? Well, I, I think conservatism is more about um, essentially following the rules, rule of law, 
being uh, faithful to the Constitution, uh, trying to do our best to actually facilitate uh, national security, foreign policy, based on both what is best for the American people as well as what's legal. Uh, just this week, I've seen some massive departures from constitutional governance. Uh, yeah. I don't believe uh, a vac vaccine mandate is, uh, is, is legal. Uh, I think there's some evidence that uh, certain members of the, ch the Joint Chiefs acted inappropriately to the point of where it may be criminal. So I don't consider those conservative values. I just consider those values that most Americans, I would like to believe, are concerned about. And yes. uh, okay. I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but I think some people, your audience will probably be surprised with some of the folks that I advise. I mean, I, I'm more than happy to reach across the aisle. Uh, one of the people I actually spoke with before she left Congress on a regular basis was Tulsi Gabbard. Uh, Tulsi was uh, uh, not only qualified uh, to speak on foreign policy, she's someone who walks the walk. She's still a member of the, uh, the Hawaiian National Guard, still does yes. work. She was yes. just off on deployment. So uh, I would like to believe we're more, um, we're more focused and linked into people who are actually uh, movers and shakers, people who want to do things. And, uh, I, you know, I, I do correspond with members of Congress regularly. I talk to them. Um, I've been in a room for some very interesting uh, uh, shenanigans where the, the decisions were made to do certain things. So, uh, you know, I'm quite, uh, I feel very privileged to be asked to come in. Uh, obviously, some of this can't be public for, for any number of reasons, but we sure. do try to, we do try to, uh, to show uh, through our podcast, through uh, editorials, all those things that a normal think tank would do, we try to get information out to the public to help them understand what we're recommending and why we're recommending it. Everything we recommend uh, behind closed doors is what we recommend. There's no, unlike Hillary Clinton, we don't have a private position and a public <laughs> position. Uh, the only thing that's nuanced is the specific details we provide those who are going to implement them. Some of the methodologies I recommend are pretty extreme and they're not always popular. And I'm not talking about anything illegal. I'm just talking about making decisions right, that, right. And, and, you, and just going through and making it happen. Okay, very good. So my follow-up question, and maybe you've answered this a little bit, but my follow-up question to that was um, how, how does your work differ um, as you are meeting with members of Congress, but particularly meeting with uh, representatives from the White House. How does your work differ depending on who has control of the White House? Because well, you, you mentioned Obama, you mentioned yeah, Trump, you, you've right. worked with both both of those administrations. I have, did. You worked, have you worked with the Biden administration at all? They're, they're not happy to ha hear anything we have to say. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. So how does... I, by the way, I know, I, know, I know Mark Milley, and I don't think he's going to have me in anytime soon to talk about it. <laughs> I don't know. I, don't, I was his guy on the transition team. I was, uh, I was, uh, I was working for Mike Flynn on the transition team, and my two guys was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and Mark Milley. and so I was the go between between Mike and and those two individuals. So I, I, it's not like I don't know these guys. Just saying. So yeah. So how, okay, let's let's put the Biden administration out of the picture just for a brief minute here. Yeah. And let's and let's address those two previous administrations. Sure. How did how did your work differ working with Trump's administration versus working with Obama's administration? Now, that's an excellent question, um, and one I have to answer kind of with a bit of. Um, background. So some of your audience may know that uh, I was uh, asked to come back and support the Obama administration uh, by creating an option to get Bergdahl back via backdoor negotiations with the Pakistani ISI. So, uh, so that, that required me to work clandestinely at the time with members of Congress. They didn't know fully what I was doing. Uh, members of the Obama administration asked me to do it. It was, uh, you know, I even spoke with Jim Mattis in his office at Tampa when we were doing it. So it, it was it was one of those things that it, it was completely nonpartisan. I, I had uh, personally, I think Bergdahl wasn't worth getting back. But, you know, 
I'm just saying. No, I'm being completely honest here. I, I, I like, appreciate that. I, I was like, uh, you want me to do what? You want me to put how much effort in? Really? Okay. You know, so, so again, setting my personal feelings aside, I, I'd like to believe I responded uh, both as a citizen and, and a think tank guy and, you know, to help out. So uh, I think I did a great deal of, of, uh, of work that was nonpartisan, that was supporting at the time their national security objectives. Uh, I didn't necessarily think that uh, they were going to come out uh, to benefit the American people, but, you know, Bergdahl needed to be recovered. I was asked to help. Beyond that, we also did things to advise members of Congress, both both political sides, uh, folks in the Pentagon. I, I was, uh, I still was meeting with folks on a regular basis, and um, and on it. Look, I, to be fast forward to now, I still meet with people who are inside the government. It's just not the White House. The White House at this point is really not digging what we had to say. But during the Obama time, I actually met at the Obama White House on uh, resilience regarding electromagnetic pulse. Uh, there was a number of things which they were somewhat open to so you know it, it's not like um they were their door was completely closed it's just that again uh our our remedies for much of what they were doing was to do the opposite of what they were doing and so it wasn't very popular and going to the trump white house well you know again and by the way people can check out my instagram most of my visits are, are documented there in some form um you know look uh, i i met with Vice President Pence had some time there with National Security Council a couple times. Uh, again, I think we had um, we had a good reception, a better reception. But again, a lot of the things we wanted to do were considered too difficult to do. Uh, Middle East peace. Uh, look, I was all for the uh, the Abraham Accords. As a matter of fact, Herb London himself had conceived of uh, a, a, what he called a condominium of agreements within the Middle East. Mm. We were working on that from the Obama administration and the Trump administration, and they were on the right path on that. Uh, we were uh, all for an Arab NATO. These are things that we had uh, talked about in 20, 2015, 2016, and I know for a fact that Mike Flynn briefed President Trump on some of the concepts. And by the way, Mike Flynn was one of our board members at the time. So I know this got to President Trump. I spoke to President Trump about this stuff. So it, it was a much friendlier environment, but Trump, Trump uh, made, mis made mistakes. Uh, the Jared uh, attempt to bring peace to the Middle East, him running around the Middle East, wasn't helpful. I said that publicly. Uh, I think other mistakes were made by some of his choices to lead organizations. Uh, so, you know, again, trying to play it down the middle and be honest and, and uh, is, is not very popular. DC does not like objective facts. Uh, and so when we try to deal with objective facts, it, it's a very difficult thing for any administration. Okay. That, okay, that's fascinating. We've addressed the Trump administration, the Obama administration. We, br we briefly uh, skimmed over Biden. But now let's focus on Biden here for a minute. Sure. Who is the Biden administration listening to? Well, not us. So look, I, and again, uh, full disclosure, I, I worked for... Brigadier General uh, uh, Lloyd Austin in, in Afghanistan in 03. He was the commander of Task Force 180. Um, I, I worked, you know, again, I've worked with Mark Milley in some instances. Uh, I, I produced a TV series a few years ago. I was one of the, uh, yeah. one of, yeah, the chain of command. I was one of the, uh, the creators and, and co-producers on that. And I personally asked Mark Milley to be in that. So, you know, um, We've had, I've had good relations with a lot of the folks, but I can tell you for a fact that Blinken is not listening to us, uh, that Austin is not listening to us. And uh, I, I, again, I don't want to go into who listens to us, but I can tell you that uh, they know uh, the recommendations we're giving uh, are, are probably the right ones, but the, uh, the, the policy, the White House policy is to ignore good advice. And I, I uh, it's been a, a very frustrating time to know that people are going to make mistakes. Uh, I said on Twitter when Biden said uh, there's no danger of the Afghan co government collapsing. I said famous last words yeah, because they were going to collapse. And, and people like us were saying it's going to happen. 
you you just you just don't understand. And I, I I'm to the point where I think I think they did understand, but they did it anyway. And that gives me another set of concerns that uh, either they're trying to crash things and create chaos, which again, then you wouldn't want our advice if that's what you're trying to do. So those are those are some interesting words you just use trying to create chaos yeah um, so okay when we're talking about foreign policy we're talking about the policies guiding the boots on the ground right in in this case in Afghanistan yeah um, and and the and the local leadership both on our side and their side and, and on and on and on so what was the thought process that went into the withdrawal in the way that it was done? What did you, so do you think you're saying trying to create chaos? Do you think that they knew? And we've had a couple other people on this podcast in the past few weeks that wonder and have made insinuations that possibly they knew exactly what was going to happen, but they did it anyway. So, yeah, look, I, uh, again, full disclosure, I, I spoke with Mike Pompeo when they were doing the, uh, the plan, the Afghan withdrawal plan. I didn't agree with everything he was doing. I, I didn't think that uh, Zal, the, 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 the guy negotiating, was the right guy. You know, it wasn't the most friendly call that Mike and I have ever had, but we had a call on it. Yeah. But for the most part, what the plan was, was going to be as, as good as you're going to get. A conditions-based withdrawal using military overwatch, military forces to enforce any infringement uh, of that agreement. And that agreement was set for uh, 1 May, where there was supposed to be a uh, an abdication. That is to say, the president, President Ghani, was to leave. He was supposed to leave, and a transitional government was supposed to come in that included the warlords, which is always a bad word, but they're there, <laughs> tribal leaders, the Afghan government, and the Taliban. It's, a, it's essentially a reconciliation. And I do believe that a conditions-based uh, withdrawal with that as an objective would have been effective. You would, not, would, have, would Afghanistan have fallen to the Taliban? Maybe. But it wouldn't have been in three days. And I think you would have seen a lot more of the tribal leaders involved trying to not support the, the fall of Afghanistan because what the Taliban was successful in doing when Biden and his staff decided arbitrarily without allies, without the Pakistanis, they decided we're going to change everything. And one of the things that's notable, and I said this to Mike Pompeo and I said it to others, you cannot do anything in Afghanistan without consulting the PACs. The PACs have got the Pakistanis have got to be on board. And if they're not on board, you're going to suffer. And I said this in my book, Operation Dark Heart. I talk about how uh, uh, I was in with Dave Barnum, the commander of forces then. And he kept trying to say, oh, no, no, we need, we need to share all this information uh, that we have. This really, it turned out Zawahiri was hiding in a place called Wana, Pakistan in 03. And so we were going to do an op to go get him. And Barno said, no, 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 you need to turn it over to Pakistan. It's like, Pakistan's going to turn it over. They're, they're part of the problem. And he wouldn't listen. And they ended up turning over the information and Zawahiri gets away. You know, how, how, how did you not see that coming? But my point is, is that um, in, in, in those situations and the way we, we you know, I've, I've talked about this, we who have studied this issue understand the dynamics. And the Trump plan was was tied, uh, was uh, was focused in such a way to, to acknowledge those realities. The Biden administration came in and changed everything. Not a thing that, that, that a Biden did was reflective in the Trump plan. As a matter of fact, he just arbitrarily changed the dates, didn't tell anybody yeah. that by that uh, uh, breaking, he then opened the door for the Taliban to say, see, the Americans can't be trusted. We, we're gonna just do what we want. And that, that one little thread tore the whole tapestry apart. And that's why, that's why a number of us said, man, it's all gonna go wrong because nobody nobody's going to abide by the agreement and then plus the moment you, re, you pull away any military force, you're done. And uh, that's what happened. So all roads of failure uh, lead directly to uh, Joe Biden. There, there's nobody else who's responsible. There was never any 300,000 man uh, military. 
30,000 maybe. And the, even that was tenuous. Uh, so, and again, I've talked to intelligence analysts uh, on the inside, and they did tell the White House, this is going to fail. Uh, every indicator is, this is going to fail. The State Department sent a cable saying, this is going to fail. And, and so anytime I see Blinken, Obama, uh, any of the other defenders out there trying to defend the Biden plan, saying, uh, you know, oh, it had to be done, I don't dispute the need to pull out of Afghanistan. I don't. I, I okay. believe we should have pulled out in 05, uh, oh, at, okay. at the latest 10. We should have been gone. We, we did our job to be gone. Uh, but that's not the premise. The premise is not should we leave or not. The premise is how did we leave and how, how on earth did you leave $85 billion worth of hardware uh, and equipment for the Taliban to become overnight one of the most powerful militaries in the face of the earth. That is what we have problems with. That's what we said would happen. And uh, to this day, they have never addressed uh, the real issues, which many of us uh, do believe that need to be addressed. Everything from Millie's bad decisions regarding Bagram to not doing anything to, to damage or, or destroy the equipment, doing nothing to prevent the loss of 13 lives at a checkpoint we knew was going to be attacked. We knew down to the hour and the location that it was going to be attacked, they, they let it happen anyway. And then, because they want to do something, they kill a translator and his family uh, with a with a with a, a, a predator. These things all are. I have a hard time believing they're all random, based on the right. fact that I've been there. I've been an operator. I've worked at the tactical level, the strategic level. I, I know how things are done. I know mistakes can be made. I'm not sure these are mistakes. That's a frightening thought. That that's that's very scary coming from from someone who understands it. But to say this about the top leadership, that is very scary. So, talking about the withdrawal, then um, it was it was a, a, a huge mess. It was a debacle. It was uh, it's probably, ongoing. It's not done. Yeah, you still have, yeah, still have sure, Americans there. Sure. So let me ask this then. Do we have foreign policy in place under Bush 43 or under Obama or Trump or anybody? Was there policy in place that would have successfully guided a withdrawal? So the, the, the answer is the mistake was made, and I document this in Operation Dark Heart, when Dave Barno, Lieutenant General Barno, decided that he was going to turn Afghanistan into Minot, North Dakota. It was never in the cards. The moment we decided to change the mission from offensive counterterrorism operations to, to facilitate the fulfillment of the authorized use of military force to kill, capture, or otherwise uh, account for all the 9-11 planners and, um, and, uh, planners and, and um, leaders, uh, that that was all we were actually authorized to do, and that's what that's all we should have done. Instead, this became what my old friend Jerry Doyle called combat to commerce. Jerry, being the, you know my my friend, actor, and radio guy, Jerry uh, would rail about what became uh, essentially a gravy train for senior officers to go do their tour in Afghanistan, get a nice medal, uh, and come back retire and go to corporate America to help fund the Afghan war. We spent a trillion dollars on the war. None of that was spent in Afghanistan. Those were spent with big, uh, with big budgets to defense contractors. Yeah. Uh, think about uh, uh, the complete uh, just magnitude of the deception. And look, these guys all knew it. These generals aren't stupid, but generals would go in there and some of these guys are my friends, and I feel bad. But I, and I would say, if, if I would say, if they were in the room, they knew, knowingly went in there. They fought the war one year at a time for twenty years, never actually tried to achieve anything like victory, pretending somehow they're going to change the momentum of ten thousand years of society in four or five years, or twenty. So there, so there wasn't a five-year plan to success. No. No. Or if no. there wasn't, or if there was, it wasn't followed. No. No, there was no plan like that. It was kind of, uh, uh, McChrystal even said one time, Drew McChrystal said, we don't understand the culture. And, and, and it's like, that's probably the brightest thing he's ever said. 
And uh, that's the issue is that uh, there was some of us, I think, did understand the culture. Uh, the path to victory in my book is similar to what uh, the last chapter of Dark Heart was uh, kind of what I thought we should do, which is basically get out, uh, work with the tribes. We, we won Afghanistan in, in, in 2001, 2002 by working with the Afghan militia forces. We didn't have to invade. And so people tend to forget how we were successful. And I said, go back to how we were successful. It's not our job to dominate uh, the Afghan people. Our job is to be one other tribe on the ground doing what we need to do to seek justice for the wrong done to us by the Taliban and by Al Qaeda. That's it. That's all we should have been there to do. And instead, we decided we're going to try to build the entire culture up. And one of the sad truths, which is obvious now, uh, Karzai, we used to jokingly say, was the mayor of Kabul. The president was nothing more than a figurehead. And uh, as long as we were his Praetorian Guard, there was quote unquote progress. Uh, and everything we did, the billions and trillions of dollars we spent was wasted because there was not going to be any change in the, the fabric of the Afghan nation and the tribes and the people because they're not, uh, they're not ungoverned, they're self-governed. It's very power down. And uh, people, most Afghan males will, will live and die never moving more than 10 miles from the point on earth they're born. Think about that. Really, There's, this is this is not a this is not a sustainable model where you're trying to bring people into the 21st century. These people are very happy with the lives they have, and I would argue that uh, people knew this. We advised them, and instead of uh, uh, understanding the reality for what it is, there was a constant projection uh, driven by other think tanks, not ours, that we just need to put a few more hundred thousand troops in there and just kind of push a little harder and they'll come around to see things our way. It was never going to be in the cards. Okay, uh, just one minute, we're gonna take a brief break. Uh, I wanna interrupt for just a brief moment and thank our sponsor, Escalante Yurts, your answer to glamorous camping. Please go online and visit escalanteyurts.com and learn about their wonderful accommodations. <clears throat> they are the absolute best place to visit and stay when you are visiting Southern Utah and the Mighty Five National Parks. Thank you, Escalante Yurts. Okay, so Tony, let's get, um, did, let me ask you this question. Is the intelligence that was received um, that helped, supposedly helped guide the decisions on how to withdraw, was there intelligence from the boots on the ground in Afghanistan and so forth that helped guide that decision? Or was it simply just made because we got to get out of there by August 31st? So the answer is there was there was poor intelligence, no doubt, because the one thing that has become difficult to, to, um, to obtain is human intelligence, clandestine stuff. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the leadership I worked for for most of my career uh, to, 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 to till this day are afraid of actually having to deal with terrorists, warlords, drug dealers. Oh, my God, these people are awful. Yes, they are. But they're the ones who are involved. And uh, until they get over this constant, oh, my God, we need to depend on signals, intelligence and Im imagery. Until you know what's going on within terrorist organizations, you're not going to have a clear picture. With that said, even with the granularity of intelligence available, all indications were that Afghan, Afghanistan was going to fall. Most of the Afghan people saw their own central government as corrupt. Uh, and that corruption, oh, it was completely corrupt. Everybody knew it. And so the moment that the, a government, uh, the, the moment that you have a uh, sentiment by the people that the, the government's corrupt, it's not sustainable. Uh, and this is one of those things that uh, even without having detailed knowledge of the Taliban plan, which I would argue, had we been paying more attention to the P Pakistani intelligence service, the ISI, we would have known what's going on. The, 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 the outcome was clear for most of us who were following this. It was going to collapse. It was going to collapse because of our inattention to detail, our breaking the agreement, the Pakistani ISI getting behind and pushing the Taliban forward and the Chinese helping as well to make sure that this was going to fail. 
and then our own side making really bad decisions. Again, uh, Milley giving up Bagram, uh, the idea that uh, there was no pushback or telling Americans, think about this, they were telling Americans as late as, as mid to late July, don't worry, everything is fine. Nobody was prepared to leave because the, the... Because they were told it was safe to be there. They were told it was safe. And so that, again, was not in accordance with the intelligence. And just look back at, at Biden's own press conference on the 8th of July, where the press even says the, uh, the intelligence community is saying that Afghanistan is going to collapse. Oh, no, it's not. Well, someone even told the freaking press, who's, you know, the best friends with the White House, that Afghanistan is going to fall. And yet Biden uh, un, unequivocally says it's not going to happen. Think about that. So people did know. The media was told by those, they, you know, people in the intelligence community leaked to the press what was going on. It was the policy. The policy was to fail. It wasn't the intelligence, it was the policy. And I've noticed that most of the debacles that are that are always assigned to intelligence failures, and they're not intelligence failures, the pieces were all there. It's a policy failure. The policy of those in charge was to ignore the intelligence and do what they wanted to do anyway, and that's what resulted in the fa failure, not the intelligence. Interesting. Okay, that that's a that's a good thing to know because, well, unfortunately for the Biden administration, it the, the more and more fingers keep pointing toward the White House rather than the other people involved on the ground or wherever and whoever it is. Right. So okay, so we've talked about uh, Obama and Trump, and we've talked about the Biden administration. We've talked about the policy. We've talked about how the withdrawal was handled and the information and so forth. So let's look at where we are today and what to do moving forward. Yeah. What do we do moving <clears throat> forward? We've got people still in Afghanistan. We've got the right. Taliban in charge. They've got tens of billions of dollars of our equipment, um, everything from uniforms and boots to, to airplane, you know, jets and so forth. What do we do, Tony? Where do we go from here? Well, let me tell you what I would do if I was in charge, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, the, what's, what probably is going to happen. Uh, first off, uh, I would fire Mark Milley. Mark Milley is not a good senior military advisor, period. There's some other things which are bouncing around out there right now which uh, are very significant regarding he, what he may or may not have done during January of this year. I don't want to get into that. That's still not certain. Uh, Mark Milley needs to go, period. Uh, he has shown that he has no uh, ability to understand complex uh, uh, military uh, challenges, and uh, he needs to go. Uh, Lloyd Austin needs to go. There are much better folks on their side. Michelle Flanoy. Michelle Flanoy, as much as I've been critical of her, would be uh, an order of magnitude better than, than, than Lloyd Austin. And I, and I, boy, I, I can't believe I'm saying that about Michelle, Michelle Flanoy, but she would be a, a thousand times better. Uh, they got to go. Uh, Blinken's got to go. Blinken, uh, anybody who watches his, his testimony, he lied constantly to them. Yeah. Uh, it, it, is, it is not even hard to see when he's lying. And he was confronted by facts that he tried to dispute. Uh, he's, he's either incompetent or has been put there to basically cover over and lie. Uh, they're, they're, so he's got to go too. And replace him, even if it's with someone on their side, on the, on, the, on the progressive side, there are better choices out there of individuals who could actually do the job and not politicize it. All those three men I just mentioned politicize everything. Yeah. Uh, and that's the, that's the problem. It, it, you cannot politicize uh, basic facts. And that's what they were trying to do. Basic Basic objective truth cannot be politicized without causing tragedy. That's what they did. They caused tragedy. And I put this all at the feet of Joe Biden. Uh, Joe Biden, I think, was briefed on all this, and I think he should be impeached. I think uh, everybody says, well, what about Kamala Harris? Kamala Harris, it may be a number of things, but I think she's technically more competent and would probably listen to advisors more than Joe Biden. Joe Biden has the arrogance of thinking, I've been here all these years, and I know what to do. And Bill Gates nailed it. 
Uh, Joe Biden has been on the wrong side of every decision in history. I rest my case. <laughs> yes. So, so that's what I would do. And obviously, I would uh, re-implement a very aggressive program to get the Americans out. I would have the U.S. Department of State and military in there, the, if, even if you have to use military force. I'd go to the Pakistanis and tell the ISI, look, you need to help us. They're the ones really behind the Taliban right now. You'd have to seek uh, help from the PACs. I think they'd be willing to do it for, you know, a price. But uh, we, we would do what we needed to to get people back out. And frankly, I don't know uh, if I would be comfortable not having any presence in Afghanistan. I'm not a nation building guy, not a neocon. But at the same time, I don't believe this over the horizon thing is going to lead to anything except for us having to reintroduce troops, special operations forces at some point. So I was one of those that really believe we should have maintained Bagram like we do in Cuba. Well, you know, we got Gitmo. Uh, Gitmo, I don't think we're ever going to give up. We shouldn't have given up Bagram. Bagram's a, a very much a safe standalone location you could have launched operations all over the region that should have been a counterterrorism and intelligence a collection base so those are the things I, I would get it back i would just say look we're sorry we're taking bagram back uh, we're gonna we're gonna be back just on this one spot and we're not gonna we don't care about your governance you do what you want uh but we're gonna be here this is our base we invested in this uh we're gonna stay and so those are the things i would do now what i think is going to happen Unfortunately, nobody's going to be held accountable. Uh, I think uh, because Biden wants this, uh, the people he has in charge are going to continue to do what he wants, which is uh, use policy uh, as a method of, of sowing tragedy. That's what they're going to do. There's going to be no changing of anything. The Americans in, in Afghanistan are going to be slowly pulled out. There's aircraft in Maza Sharif right now sitting there for weeks now. Uh, there's, by my count, still 3,000 in, in Afghanistan who want to leave. The Taliban is going to continue to use them as hostages. I'm sorry, that $64 million uh, uh, humanitarian aid, that's a payoff. We're paying these people to let Americans out. That's what's, that's what's going on. This is 1979 all over. And again, this is the policy. This isn't because we don't know what's going on. It's because Blinken keeps putting pressure on third countries, Oman and others, threatening them, if you take one of these airplanes out of Afghanistan, we're going to cut off your aid. So our own State Department is assisting the Taliban in holding these people for ransom. That's how bad it is. Uh, and so again, that's policy. That is their policy to do this. So circling back to your original question, there's not a thing I could recommend to these people uh, that they'd listen to based on the fact that their policy is to create the conditions for chaos we now see and to make it very difficult for the Americans there to get out. It's, 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 it's a tragedy wrapped in a, uh, in a larger uh, destruction of all military concepts and good governance. Okay, so you've talked about Milley and Austin and Blinken. Uh, you talked about Kamala. Let me ask you a, a, another interesting question. You know, on sure. this podcast, the Political Courage podcast, we deal with current affairs and so forth, but we also deal a lot with history. And we look yeah. at... Uh, people from history and and so forth. So let me ask you this: With Blinken in there as Secretary of State, what would have been different if you look at the past twenty years or so and the different uh, liberal secretaries of state, be it Hillary, Hillary or John Kerry, what would have been different with those two in versus uh, Blinken? Well, somebody could have made a smart decision like, I th was, it, uh, was it Bill Clinton that actually brought in a Republican to be Secretary of State or Secretary of Defense? Anyway, he, you could he, have actually, offered, he offered him the job, but he turned it down. Yeah. So you could actually reach across the aisle and pull people in because True. your party doesn't have people who are competent, just saying. And John Kerry, no difference. Um, uh, Hillary Clinton, definitely no difference. I mean, we saw what happened. No, we saw what happened in Libya. I, no? I mean, I so, so this is the issue. Their, their side, the, the, the progressive side, works to project and act based on aspirations, not on reality. Uh, oh, there was a video that caused people to uprise in over in Benghazi. There was no video. Most of the people who were there in Benghazi, don't even have computers to watch the freaking video on, for God's sake. 
this, they create fiction that explains away their own policy failures. If they do this all the time, Blinken, the last two days of his testimony, it's all been excuse, excuses, excuse that. Oh yes, I want accountability too. It's all, it's all based on how they can take an action. The action is doomed to fail. It fails. And then they go about trying to create uh, stories that sound really good that they can tell over and over that have no link to the ground truth facts that we all know to be true. And so no other, there's no other secretary of state that I know of in the Biden administration, or the, the I'm sorry, the, the Obama administration, uh, the Clinton administration that would have done anything different than what we've seen demonstrated to, uh, through, through Tony Blinken. Okay. So right up front, or at the beginning of, of our discussion here, you were talking about the different uh, facets of political science and international affairs. And, and, and one of those you mentioned was the human side. The, yeah. the, and so I interpret that as kind of being the human rights side of that. So last week I interviewed a freelance journalist, uh, Hizbullah Khan, who is currently stuck in Kabul. Mm -hmm. He has tried to get out. He has applied to different governments to, to get a, an exit visa and get out. He, at the time, I haven't spoken to him in a week or so, but at the time, a week and a half ago or so, he was traveling around Kabul every day, sleeping in a different location, trying to avoid being uh, found out and caught by the Taliban. So supposedly there's thousands of people in similar situations that are, just trying to remain alive and safe. Right. Uh, both U.S. citizens and pro-democracy Afghans who aided the U.S. and its allies and so forth. So looking at where we are right now, okay, if, if Joe Biden woke up tomorrow morning, if Blinken woke up tomorrow morning and decided, I am going to be the dude, I am going to be courageous. I am going to lead. I don't care what anybody says. I'm going to do the right thing. Regarding all those people that are still in the country, what would they do if they woke up tomorrow and wanted to be that guy? So two things. First, uh, clarify through being honest, how many people they know are still in Afghanistan. Blinken continues to lie about the number. I, I think it's about 3000, tick more or less, but somewhere in there. And then go about saying, look, some, we've made some mistakes. This is what we're going to do. Please make sure you identify yourselves to us uh, and then start working. If they don't want to use government resources, I know for a fact, because London Center is part of it. Uh, we're part of this uh, task force, Pineapple, uh, trying to get everybody out. Work with those individuals who have volunteered resources, aircraft, and time to get people out. Just, so, just, just do your job. That's all you have to do. Do your job. Focus on American citizens. Get them out. Secondly, you have to then go about trying to repair the perception that uh, the the, uh, the country is completely rudderless regarding foreign policy. It's not just about Afghanistan. It's about China. It's about Iran. It's about North Korea. It's about uh, Russia. By the fact that the more weakness shown, the more challengers are going to take advantage of that. And the other thing you're going to have to do is say, you know, there's a new sheriff in town. Uh, I, don't, I think you have to bring a new sheriff in to say there's a new sheriff in town and that we're going to change how we result, how we resolve differences. And we're going to be, while we would like to cooperate, we are not afraid to use military force if necessary to protect uh, our allies and our objectives. And those are the two things that would have to be done. The human rights thing, I think, is very troubling. First, um, uh, I'm friends with Ambassador Rick Rennell. Uh, I, a lot of people know he's openly gay. And it's ironic that the very uh, folks who uh, always protest that they're the party of gay and lesbians and all these other rights are the ones most facilitating radical Islam to target uh, these people. Think about that. It's just, it's just totally insane. The same thing with women. Uh, I, I'm a big believer in women's rights. Anybody who looks at my, my history and who I've worked with, I've worked for female generals. I've, wor I've had amazing deputy females. Uh, 
boy, you know, they there is no doubt there they should be treated equal. They are equal. That you've now allowed for uh, the circumstance to exist where you have women going to and they're going to be treated like chattel. Uh, and again, uh, I don't know how. Maybe it's because they're the party of Harvey Weinstein. They really don't care deep down. But it's very clear that these human rights issues are not really all that important to the people who claim that they're the ones who are the font of all human rights. Okay, very good, fascinating. So um, has, so let's look at both sides of the, the aisle, so to speak, and have, have people on both sides of the aisle learned something through this debacle over the past month? <laughs> Will, will, will foreign policy change? Based well, on it, has, it has changed. That's the problem. Not for the better. Uh, I think that uh, the Trump administration worked a great deal to reestablish uh, respect for the United States. To say that uh, while we're your friends, we'll be the best friend you ever have. We have our own interests and our own objectives. And that is to protect the American people. Uh, that no longer is true. We are just talking about American citizens being left in harm's way in Afghanistan. That was a policy decision. Uh, there's been weakness shown across the board with China. China is yelling at people uh, during meetings. Like I, I wouldn't take that on a personal level, let alone uh, when Blinken was being yelled at in Alaska by this this Chinese foreign minister. It's like, dude. We're done here. Until you can be civil, there's no need to sit and have a conversation. Why and just walk out? Uh, Blinken apologizing over and over for weakness simply shows weakness, and it's going to cost us. So the policy, the, the foreign policy has changed, and it's going to get worse. Uh, I would argue that you're going to see a series of things happening over the next year, which this administration will have no capability to deal with. None. It's because of their lack of, uh, of uh, acuity and lack of interest in actually showing strength and defending American values. We just talked about American values not being defended in human rights. Uh, one of the, I can't remember who it was. I think Joe Biden himself said he understands why China has to conduct the genocide for the Ungers. Really? I've never known that Americans uh, understand genocide. I, that's not a value I have, not a value anybody I know supports. Yet he said that. So this is this is where we're at, and uh, it's just not going to be. Uh, it's not going to get any better with the current folks in charge. Okay, so um, are there young people within the two sides of the aisle that are young, courageous, forward-thinking people? who can step in and start making correct policy, correct decisions, correct decisions when they're under fire and the pressure's on and the opposition is heated. Are there people, young leadership, young talent that's waiting in the, side, in the wings, ready to take charge? No. The, not the Democrats. That, that's, that's a frightening answer. No, look, let me tell you, I spoke to someone who is who works with the Biden administration uh, very closely. Uh, the people you're talking about are there. They're all young, 20, 30, uh, all out for themselves, all careers, uh, all coming out of uh, what I would argue is a very broken education system with uh, wonderful expensive degrees that have taught them nothing about real life or how to deal with challenges, completely lacking any critical thinking skills. And uh, one of the challenges I've been told is going on on the inside of the Biden administration is that everybody's out for themselves. There's no cohesion. One of the notable things, and I, again, I mentioned I'm, I'm friends and mentors with a number of the Reagan uh, White House folks. There was cohesion. The, President Reagan built a team. And one of the things we, the London Center, are going to be doing is trying to do interviews with Reagan's men, uh, talking about how these men... Uh, and their, uh, who were staff actually not only understood Reagan's intent, they had to basically think on their own, uh, have their own ability to think and do based on 
what they agreed to do as a team. It was a team effort. And I think it showed. There's no such team effort uh, in existence right now. And it seems to me based on... Uh, So when you say there's no team effort like that, you're talking both sides of the aisle then. I'm talking pretty much both sides of the aisle because even the, the, the Republican side... You don't see a lot of people trying to pull things together uh, and actually try to unify around a handful of concepts. And again, I deal with members of Congress, uh, both sides of the aisle. Uh, At least on the Republican side, I see some hope. I see some very young folks coming up. Uh, uh, Kimberly Klasik, Kimberly is amazing. Uh, She she should get, I hope she wins her, gets an office eventually. Uh, Sean Parnell. I know Sean, he's a great guy, a uh, military guy. There's some talent uh, that I see out there that has great potential, uh, great potential to do good. But the establishment, don't want it. The yeah. establishment, uh, uh, let me just take a quick uh, specific. I, I supported for Virginia governor, Jose de la Pena. Jose, uh, retired army colonel, immigrant from Mexico, loves America because he sees what a great country America is. He lost to Yonkin, who's now running for governor. Uh, to me, Jose would have been a superior candidate because he can talk to those who have come to the United States to be Americans. And I think uh, things like that. The establishment tends to go with people who I don't think are the best qualified, but they're safe. At least they yeah. think it's safe. And the Democrats are the same way, if not worse, regarding old people. Everybody I know in the Democrat Party uh, who was in a position of authority or all old. I mean, old, old. I'm old, but they're old. So just saying. Okay. Um, that You know, that's interesting that you say that because uh, Michael Johns was on this. We had him on the podcast here two or three weeks ago, and he said the same thing. He said that the art of collaboration is gone out of politics in today's world. And... Mm-hmm. And that's basically what you're saying as well. Yeah. So, Look, the, yeah, the, 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 um, there was a place I used to hang out my my younger deba- debauchery days called Shana- uh, called uh, Ireland's Own in Old Town Alexandria. It's closed now, unfortunately. And uh, Ireland's Own had a plaque in the back of the room at the time where Tip O'Neill, Speaker of the House, and Ronald Reagan had sat down to have a few pints of, of, uh, of uh, ale. beer, yeah. of ale, of, of uh, Guinness Stout, and talk out some issues and get things done. The day when you can have the Speaker of the House sit down with the uh, opposition, the Democrat with a Republican president, it's gone. And the, the idea that, that we're all Americans first and we're going to find a way through this doesn't seem to be there at this point. And that's, it's a very sad thing. Okay, before we end here, Tony, I'm gonna sure. I'm gonna put you on the spot. <laughs> okay. Okay. If you haven't already been put on the spot, I don't think you have. So we, like I said, we're the Political Courage Podcast. In the yeah. past, as we have done these interviews, I've asked different people their opinions on the courageous acts of previous United States presidents. Okay. Yeah. So I'm gonna so I'm gonna do that with you, and I'm gonna put you on the spot. Okay. That's that's been very fascinating, and it's been quite popular. We've gotten a, you know a fair amount of feedback on that. It's been kind of fun. So, what was the most courageous act by Donald Trump while he was in office? Oh man, that's a tough question. It's going to get tougher. Yeah, <laughs> I think the most courageous act that uh, he made during the time he was in office was what is it what this is i'm drawing a blank let me think about this for That's a second. that one's scary <laughs> no i mean look you know i've i've been i've said a number of times that there was good and bad things from the trump administration i stick to that but i you know the most courageous thing i think he did was um to go about making decisions regarding some of the pardons he did, despite what he knew he would do. Look, he, uh, he pardoned uh, Blagodovich, 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 the governor from uh, Illinois. At the same time, he, he pardoned a bunch of other folks. Uh, uh, 
Oh my goodness, commissioner, police commissioner. Uh, oh my God, Bernie Kerik. So you know, he just he would do things. I don't think he went far enough, but I think uh, that it took some great courage just to do things that he knew was going to be highly unpopular, and he did them anyway. So I think that, okay. that that was one of the things I think he did very well. All right, the most courageous act by Barack Obama. Um. Well, that's tough. It is tough. You have to scan back over four to eight years. And yeah. Um, I think the most courageous act that he did was to, to not stop the bin Laden raid once it was underway. Uh, I think uh, I've heard stories about how that happened. Um, and basically, uh, uh, a decision was made to launch. And he was told that, oh, by the way, Mr. President, the helicopters are on the way. And he did not listen to Joe Biden, who said we shouldn't do the raid. So I think that. Oh, that really? Him. I didn't know that. So yeah. Biden Biden uh, gave his and, opinion uh, to, to fall out. He, he was against it. Yeah. If it wasn't for Panetta, if it wasn't for the CIA director, uh, it oh. wouldn't have happened. But he didn't stop. It. So I'll, I'll give him that. Yeah. OK. Uh, George W. Bush. George W. Bush, I think, uh, uh, boy, that's that's really going back now. As you know, I was a whistleblower against this White House, so I'm not very popular with him, and I wasn't, you know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So... By the way, yeah, and, and yeah, Don Rumsfeld, as you know, passed recently. Don and I made up before he passed, thank God. But, uh, uh, you know, going against the Pentagon is never an easy thing, when yeah. even though you, yeah. you know you're right. I, I think the, the, the most courageous thing he did was essentially to, uh, to um, be very clear uh, right after 9-11. Uh, I think he was able to focus the country properly do the right things to get the military going in the right direction. He made some mistakes after that, but I think it was, uh, he was very good about organizing that. Okay. Very good. And the last one, you mentioned Ronald Reagan. So let's go with Ronald Reagan. Reagan, I think, um, launching, uh, launching Star Wars. Mm. So let me explain why I say that. Um, there was no Star Wars. It was it was a concept. Uh, I know this from talking to the men involved, to include, you know, his own, you know, Bud, Bud McFarlane and Ambassador Hank Cooper. They created this whole myth that somehow we were going to create a shield that would prevent the Russians from ever being able to hit anything. Complete. But Reagan, ever the the chess the consummate actor and chess player said because he was once told it's like sir uh no this is not going to work uh only a, 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 you know we we don't think that uh, the russians are going to be fully convinced and, and reagan said there's only one man i have to convince and that's gorbachev <laughs> and that's it and so that's how they did it they were able to play this big psych game and I think it took courage to, to, to let that happen because so many things could have could have gone wrong. But uh, it, I think that is an act of of uh, great poker bluffering, but bu uh, bluffing was able to create conditions for the Soviets. The final thing to push the Soviets over the edge to collapse. Yeah. Them. So I think that was his biggest uh, act of, of courage. Fantastic. Tony, this has been uh, wonderful. It's been fascinating. We, I have enjoyed having you here. Maybe we can have you again sometime. Uh, thank you, Tony Schaefer, president of the London Center for Policy Research. This has been the Political Courage Podcast. Thank you for joining us. Please visit us online at douglas-perkins.com and visit our sponsor, escalantyyurts.com. Thank you and have a great day.